Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I don't think will be long tonight, but every time I say that, I'm wrong, but I'll say it again. It makes you all feel better for a while, and uh, appreciate that. I got a note here from Brother Mike Harris. I want you to pray for his mother, Clara Harris. She'll be having another procedure tomorrow to have her heart uh, shocked. Uh, she's in AFib, and uh, if you please pray, she'll be 90 years old on the 22nd. And let's pray for Miss Clara Harris. Put her on your list. Be praying uh, tomorrow for all of that. And uh, ask God to bless there. And her and her husband, their health has been up and down here lately. And we're asking God just to be a blessing there. Uh, good to have the Whetstones with us for just a while. They're out on the gospel trail. And they're not with us often. But we love you all. We thank God for all that uh, God lets you do. He's going to make a quick trip to Togo, West Africa. Just kind of. Change his schedule up somewhat to help a ministry there. I want you to pray for him specifically. Uh, he's got his hands, hands full as he goes over and uh, ask God to give him direction and wisdom. So all the Stovers that back there this morning, they are East Tennessee transplants. And uh, most of you know that he has an RV dealership. His, his family does. And so sometimes he comes down to visit this one. And he's here today. And so we're thankful for he and his wife and family. And we had many guests this morning. He had just a lot of folks and we have a lot of folks looking at our church right now, and we're praying for each of them, asking the Lord just to bless and help there. Let's stand together, please, read just a few verses here, familiar verses. We'll cover much of this chapter tonight, and uh, I want you to look at um, verse 15, let me read down through verse 17, and we'll take a text. Romans chapter 1, verse 15, so as much as, it, as in me is, well, what a statement that is. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul did not start the church at Rome. Uh, history indicates Peter didn't either. <laughs> I know that's a great letdown for, for many, but uh, it was most likely started by uh, Christians that had migrated to that, that city. By the time of Paul, Paul's writings, it was a, the, world, the world power, superpower, and uh, it lasted for many years, over a million people just in the city of Rome itself as he was writing. And it was a city of opulence and squalor together. There was no middle class. It was just slums or complete beautiful palaces. And so Paul is preaching uh, actually in this letter to them. He says, I'm ready to come there and preach the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, that is inside the gospel and part of the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And draw your attention to verse 16. Let's read that out loud together. We'll use that as our text. Let's read that together. Ready? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. How many believe that? Amen. Amen. I believe that. I don't want you to answer this question, but tonight, are you ashamed of the gospel? I hope not. It seems like, to a certain extent, we have forsaken the gospel in America. It's not being forsaken in a lot of other countries. In fact, this is a, this is a, a problem and burden for Western countries, but especially in places like China and Iran and other places, the gospel is going forth with great power right now. They say that there is quite a movement, if you can believe this, in Afghanistan right now with underground churches and Christians being saved. And we don't get to hear a lot about that, but how many understand that God knows all about it? Wouldn't it be awful if, if America, one nation under God, got left in the dust in this matter of the gospel? And... Uh, I, uh, in just a while, I'm going to read down through verses 18 through 32 with a little bit of light commentary. But as you read through those verses, you're going to find that the world is in a mess. And I want to take a title from this entire chapter and give it this title, The Only Way Out of This Mess. The Only Way Out of This Mess. If you look at what is going on in the world you're left scratching your head and wondering, couldn't, couldn't somebody just come in here and fix this for us? 
Well, somebody will fix it someday, but it's not going to be God because we're headed for another place. It's going to be Antichrist. And so nothing can stop what, what God is doing and getting us out of here. But there's something that should be paramount and prevalent in the last days, and that is the gospel. And I want to talk about that for just a while. I want to give us some courage tonight as a church family. Let's pray together. Father, bless your word. Challenge us, Lord, tonight with what we're about to say. I need your help as I preach. And I pray that you won't leave me up here all by myself. And I pray tonight that you'll let the word of God sink deeply inside of each of us. and Help us to respond and make a commitment to do that just now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. I'll not go into all of the problems in the world today because I'm trying to move away from that to a certain extent. Uh, last week we started a little series on this thought for the sake of the gospel. This is part two of that message. I used the text where this statement came from the lips of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. And I tried to preach a message entitled, Some Things We Should Do for the Gospel's Sake and Why. And I made this, this quick definition of that word sake. And here it is again. The word sake means for the purpose of, in the interest of, in order to achieve or preserve to participate out of consideration for or in order to help another and that another is the Lord Jesus Christ and he says he says could you not share the gospel for my sake and for the sake of others and the gospel's sake so Jesus in Mark 8 was pleading with his disciples to take the gospel to the ends of the earth for his sake it appears to me and not just me to many other preachers and writers it appears to me that we are coming, in fact, to the end of the age. Boy, is it ever a mess. The Bible predicted this, that in the last days, that men should wax worse and worse. In the last days, there would be perilous times. And uh, as we read Romans chapter 1, we get this uh, prelude about the gospel in chapter 1, the first 17 verses in verse number 18 he he shows us what the problem was in his day and this is much of this is prophetical but this was going on in the wicked city of Rome in Paul's day I want to just kind of read through it with a little bit of, of, of commentary but I want to pull out two words here and show you why this is connecting the Bible says in verse number 17, for therein, speaking in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. Circle that word revealed. So what we're finding out is the hope of the world or the righteous or righteous living and salvation and all that's contained in the gospel is revealed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then in verse 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed Sir, that word revealed, and draw a little error there. This actually divides the chapter. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So we understand that the gospel is the staying power, you might say, in this world. Can I get you to understand that one moment after the rapture, the influence and the restraining power of the Spirit of God lists from this world, and you think it's bad now, you haven't seen nothing yet. I'm just saying the entire world right now has a force of civility only because of the gospel and the Spirit of God. And it appears to be becoming worse certainly because we're living in those last days, but there are fewer Christians, there's fewer adhering to the gospel and the word of God, but also the spirit of Antichrist uh, is rising. 
And God is preparing the minds of the saved and the unsaved for what's about to happen. He's preparing the minds of the saved to wake us up and be ready. And I just want you to know the church hasn't, in America that is, has not completely awakened. And that's our job. Not just my job as your pastor. That's your job to stir yourself up and wake yourself up. But there is another blindness occurring in our world today. And you may think, you may say, how in the world can people believe the stuff that's being thrown at them? I used to think, I used to think, how could, how could millions of Christians leave this planet in the rapture and it not uh, cause any question of the people left behind? I'm starting to figure that out. There is a blindness that is occurring right now that is completely off the hook. And you need to understand that Satan is behind all of that. So God is getting this world ready, and it's our job to take the light of the gospel. Somebody says, well, preacher, if that's going on, and God has lifted the hedge, and Satan is doing this, and allowing this, then there must not be no hope for those that are unsaved. No, there's great hope, because it's Satan that blinds the, eye, the minds uh, of those without Christ, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. And you and I should be the lights of the gospel, shining that light of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ to all of those around us. All of those. So there's revelation occurring. There's something happening. So not just does the gospel reveal the righteousness of God, but the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And what that means is this world, especially America, I, I, again, I'll say this, I can't vouch for other countries, but this nation right here has had the gospel shoved up both nose holes for over 200 years. And today, men willingly reject it. Because that which may be known of God is manifest, manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You say, how do you do that? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You have what is called natural revelation. Uh, then you have the revelation of the word of God. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, that just what you and I and what mankind knows about this world's creation ought to be enough for us to know that there is intelligent being, and that intelligent being is God. The sun, the moon, the stars, the sea, the blue skies, the, 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 all, of, all of creation right now. You and I are seeing the beauty of creation splash before our very eyes and the intricacy of the body and all those things, all of it points to the fact that this world uh, was not created uh, out of uh, some explosion. This world was created by Almighty God. Basic logic teaches that. But also you and I have the Word of God that tells us who the Creator is and the Creator is God, and that's throughout the Bible. And so the Bible says that it's clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, verse 20, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I was preaching this morning about the gospel, and I understand that on Sunday mornings, this place is filled with guests. And I got to dawn on me that maybe some had not been in a service where there was an invitation given in a long time. You, you understand that a lot of churches, they do not give invitations. You understand that. You're used to coming to this church all the time, and there's many places around right here in our city. They don't give people a chance to respond. As long as I'm your pastor, we'll always give people a chance to respond. But then I got to thinking about, you know, preaching on the love of God. Now, you and I know... That God is love. How many of y'all understand God is love? God has given us this age of grace for men, women, boys, and girls to get saved. And then I turn around and talk about hell. The average person said, wait, wait, time out. <laughs> if God is a God of love, how in the world would he send, ever send a person to hell? So if you listen to me this morning, I chimed in a little bit of theology that hell was made for the devil and his angels. That's what the Bible says. 
And I know that wasn't enough for a lot of people there, but you got to, I'm trying to be sensitive to my audience uh, Sunday morning. And I throw that out there, but I want to tell you that should understand the scriptures, what the Bible says here. The Bible says uh, that we have seen all these things in verse 20, so that they are without excuse. The truth of it is, it doesn't matter how uh, reprobate a person can become, God in some way has revealed himself to that person. Even in, even in foreign countries, they understand that there's something that's uh, bigger than them. That's why they have some form of worship. I move on. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Watch this now. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to, uh, to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. You got to write in your Bible, idols. So when man got this natural revelation of the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and all of this, the animals and so forth, instead of attributing all of that power and worth to God and worship to God, then they made animals. They made idols. It gets worse. Look at verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. This is speaking about the illicit relationships that we see propagated by Hollywood now who change the truth of God into a lie and worship to serve the creature more than the creator. In my Bible, that's a capital C creator who is blessed forever, a man. So we have now creature worship. We have idolatry. We have creature worship. And whenever, whenever a person walks away from the belief and the worship of their creator, Things get worse for them. <clears throat> for this cause, verse 26, God gave them up unto vile affections or passions. For even their women did change their natural use into the, that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. That's the understatement of the year. And receiving in themselves that recompense or that reward or that payment of their error which was meat or do them. I, 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 I preached several times in the last two weeks, and so I don't know where I've said this, but, and I probably said it here, and if I did, I apologize. But right now, I was told that in California right now, there are 52 different genders that you can have placed on your birth certificate. For those of you who are confused about that, there's only two. In California right now, it is illegal for a toy store or someplace like Walmart to have uh, a boy toy owl and a girl toy owl. They say they're trying to make laws now of, of it be illegal to separate boys' clothing from girls' clothing. And I know you're thinking, well, that's just quacked out thinking. No, that is thinking from people or a generation that's moved away from God and said we don't need him. So we're in this mess Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, but we're there right now, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. This is indifference, idolatry, immorality, indifference. Being filled, in other words, this is the consuming last day attitude. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, uh, maliciousness, Full of envy and murder and debate. That word debate is, is, talks about strife and deceit and malignity. In other words, this thing spreads and whispers and bite backbiters and, uh, and haters of God. Uh, despiteful, uh, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, that means irreconcilable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God. What's that mean? They know God, and they know God's a creator, 
and they intensely walk away from God. They know the wrath of God, but they don't fear the wrath of God. By the way, you ought to turn to Revelation chapter 6 and find out that someday the kings of this world are going to run for the hills and they're going to cry for the rocks to fall on them. I mean, they're going to hold out as long as they can. Psalm chapter 2 talks about how the kings uh, imagine a vain thing in their mind that they can overthrow God. There are people right now in this world that believe that. They have followers. The Bible says here in verse number 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, underscore this phrase, but have pleasure in them that do them. In fact, they make their money off of this vice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world we live in. How do we get out of this mess? How in the world do we get out of this mess? I want you to write several things down. Number one, write this down. First of all, we see the origin of the gospel. The word gospel is used three times in the first 17 verses. I'm not going to cover all this for the sake of time. Paul was anxious to get to Rome. We see, number one, the origin of the gospel. What is the gospel? Verse number one, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised a four, a four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. What's he saying? He's saying the gospel came from God. The gospel is of God. The gospel is not some uh, plan B. The gospel is plan A. There is no plan B. And God had prepared the gospel before the foundation of the world. The prophets talked about it. It was all mentioned. Messiah was mentioned in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible says. In fact, Jesus was there at creation. This isn't an afterthought. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus is all about. The gospel, he came down, he died, he declared he was the son of God. He died on the cross. And the Bible talks about verse 4, his resurrection from the dead, which is the capstone of the gospel. We don't have a dead Savior. We've got a living Savior. And all this was originated by God Almighty himself. Number two, we have the ordained to the gospel. Who gives us out? Well, certainly the, the apostle Paul was one. But look what he says in these Romans. He says in verse 5, By whom we receive grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye, circle this next word, also the call of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He's saying those of you that are born again, you're called to be saints. But you're called to give out the gospel just like I'm called to give out the gospel. Now, I want to talk to our church family just a moment. I know you know what I'm getting ready to say, but you need to hear me say it again. I am not the only one that's supposed to give out the gospel. This pulpit is not the only place that you're to hear the gospel. We just came through the book of Acts. They went every day from house to house giving out the gospel. My staff is not the only person that's to give out the gospel. Every one of us should know the gospel and learn how to give it out. Amen. I use the phrase ordained loosely because I'm using these O's in an alliterated outline. And so I'm not saying that you're ordained like you lay hands on a pastor or whatever to be ordained. I am saying that you are set apart, every Christian is set apart to give out the gospel. Paul said, and we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. All of us are. And so um, it wasn't just the apostle, but all the saved were to be obedient to give out the gospel. Watch how he explains it. Verse 5, he says, he says, for him, that is, for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That phrase, obedience to the faith, is not talking about his salvation experience. Naturally, he had to obey the gospel to be saved. Obedience, the phrase, obedience to the faith, is talking about the citadel of learning found in the Bible, which starts with the gospel. He said, I am obedient, I am committed to faith in God and carrying the faith to all nations, he says, 
for the, his name, that means for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel. Number three, jot this down. We see now the obligation of the gospel as this ties in to the idea of our theme for the sake of the gospel. As Jesus made that statement, he said to take up your cross and follow him for my sake and the gospels. He is praying, you might say, or he is weighing on the emotions of the disciples and he's saying, you've got to do this. I came down, I died on the cross, I was buried three days, I'm alive right now. If you fail, if the disciples which came, became apostles, if you fail in this, the world is lost. Do you, you understand that? Do you understand that Jesus Christ put all that he had done on that cross in the hands of 11 spirit-filled men? And they got it right. And you're saved because they got it right. Then we get to the Great Commission as Jesus goes away. And he knew these disciples would all die someday. And he put the weight of the gospel on the rest of us. On every generation. If we fail to get the gospel out, we fail to do this for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of things I guess we could do for Jesus, but this is the one he asks us to do. The obligation, Paul feels it as he gets to verse 14. He says to these Romans, he says, I'm a debtor. I've got an obligation, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so much so, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. I wish you could feel the emotion and the tense in his voice. Paul felt like that he was a debtor to the unsaved world. Now, we studied the life of Paul as we went through the book of Acts, and this was a remarkable man. But nevertheless, he was a man of like passions just like you and I. And he came to the place as he wrote these Romans, as he, as he considered coming that, that vast empire, city, capital city of the whole world. He thought about this. He thought about if this church right there in Rome could see revival, if this church would get excited about the gospel, if I could get there and fire them up about the gospel, they could turn this world upside down because of their locality and their geographical position that's what was on his heart he says i just feel an obligation there now, i'm not trying to embarrass you i'm not trying to shame you i'm just saying this if you're born again right now you know this i just preached this this morning there's not one thing you need to do in order to go to heaven god's not like that your salvation is unmerited it's by grace. But all of us should feel a certain obligation for at least our family, our co-workers, our neighbors. And I'm asking you tonight to reach down inside of yourself and begin to build a little fire, a little ember down inside there where you begin to feel something for the lost and dying around you one more time. You can watch the news and sit back and stay tore up about half the time. We were flying out of California the other day and I went out to preach in chapel. And I'd, I'd just been out there a few weeks earlier and they banked that plane coming out of L.A. over the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And I looked out there and I saw all those ships out there, hundreds of them. Well, I shouldn't say hundreds, but near a hundred. They said at that, uh, several weeks ago when I was there, 115 ships out there off of Long Island, Newport. I said, well, right there she is, as far as the eye could see. I was just back a, a week ago, a quick trip. I flew out there, and I was flying out, and I, thought I was, didn't get a window seat, and I wanted to kind of look out. And the guy behind me knew what I was doing. He said, uh, he said you looking for them ships out there? We carry on a conversation. I'm not going to tell you about that conversation because the lady sitting next to me did not feel the same way I felt about it. And I had my mask on, I had it pulled up. 
But there's all still there. And you know what? There's not one thing you can do about it. Well, my Christmas presents, I've got, I've got a family member's got a tractor on one of those things. We got a guy in the church that got a four-wheeler on one of those ships out there. Well, my wife was telling my brother-in-law back in West Virginia, my brother, brother Bill lives back home. He's got a farm. He's as redneck as you're going to get. He said, I'll tell you what, Mila. He said, I've got a notion to just hop in my truck and drive out there. I can run them cranes. We'll just get them ships unloaded. And he meant it. But he's not going to do that. There's not one thing you can do about it. There's not one thing you can do about all the junk that's going on in this world right here other than vote right. I guess we might could start there. But the best thing you can do is feel an obligation like never before down inside of you to give out the gospel with power. The obligation of the gospel, Paul felt that as much as in me is, willing to sacrifice to give out the gospel. Number four, the obedience to the gospel. I don't have time to do this justice because I've got another point I want to spend some time on, but maybe we'll go back and preach verse 16. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. A lot of theology there, but Paul was saying this. He said, I, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I can tell you this. That's not the case with the average Christian. The average Christian is downright embarrassed about the fact that God commands us to give out the gospel, but we're embarrassed to do it. Now, I'm going to ask you as a church family to get over that tonight just, just as quick as you can. I don't think you understand just how powerful the gospel is. The Bible says that it has so much power, this, this, this phrase, the death, burial, and resurrection, the Bible says here that if you believe that, and that power is exercised, that person converted and born again. Regeneration takes place. The Spirit of God comes inside. Uh, their name is in the book of heaven. There's just so much that goes on right there. Immediately when somebody prays and trusts Christ the Savior, and ladies and gentlemen, there was a day that you did that, and you felt that in your life when God took you and changed you. Amen. Everybody deserves to hear it. It's not saying the gospel doesn't have power if somebody doesn't believe, but it is saying that if a person does believe, immediately it's witnessed. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, we're empowered by it. And the righteousness of God, verse number 17, is revealed therein. You know this phrase we, we talk about, I think it's 1 Corinthians 5 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. How many ever heard that? You ever heard that? Most of you have. Do you know why that happens? Because of this verse right here. It teaches us that the moment a person gets saved, there is an enlightenment. There's a light that comes on where they want to do what's right. They got the Holy Spirit now lives inside them to guide them. And they've got the word of God as they learn the word of God that teaches them how to live a righteous life. That's what America needs. And that's what the world needs. I'll give you one more point and I'm finished. We see number five, the opportunity of the gospel. The opportunity of the gospel. I gave this message a title, the only way out of this mess. Why would I say that the gospel is the only way out of the mess that we're in? Because it is. I think that God put the first 17 verses in Romans chapter 1, knowing what we was going to write in those last verses, 18 through 32. He was going to show us, show us what the world was going to be like. But he was going to show us, first of all, how to get out of it. I think that we're in the greatest generation for preaching the gospel that the world has ever had. It is a great opportunity. I want you to write down these three things in closing, and I'm finished. I think it's a great opportunity, number one, because 
for the sake of the perishing. Naturally, it stands to reason that everyone that gets saved, it's, a, it's the greatest opportunity for them. Those who can be saved from a devil's hell. But secondly, secondly, why do I say it's a great opportunity? And that is for the sake of the possibility of revival. We're never going to see revival. What is revival? Revival is not a time that Christians get saved. They're already saved. Reviving is a time that Christians come alive, especially to the gospel. We have a possibility of seeing a revival in our nation that could spill out through the world. It's happened two, really historically, three times since the New Testament church was formed. We have that distinct opportunity. I'm not saying we're going to have it. I'm saying we're not going to have it if we don't exercise full-blown obligation of the gospel. But number three, I want you to consider this. I'm going to stick with number two, but number three. Why is this such a great opportunity? Number three, for the sake of the preparation of the Lord's return. The preaching of the gospel can literally hasten the Lord's return. Matthew 24, 14, I'm going to read it, but I want to give you the context. We've taught on this chapter. Matthew 24, 14, our Lord says this, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Now, I've got to give that to you in context. Matthew chapter 24 is speaking in particular of the tribulation period. And there will be mul multitudes saved during the tribulation period. 144 spirit-filled Jewish evangelists will cover this globe preaching the gospel. They'll be persecuted for it. And there'll be people saved. And thank God for that. But you and I aren't going to be there for that. Now, if I, if I can say it like this, just like you're seeing things line up for what happens after the rapture, I think the same is true for this doctrine as well. Let me take a moment to explain. We understand that the next thing on the time clock is the rapture of the church, the prophecy time clock, the rapture of the church. All Bible scholars agree that there's nothing else that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. Nothing. Matthew chapter 24 lets us know how close the time clock is ticking because it details some major spiritual things that happened in the tribulation period. And as those things that we know are going to happen then after the rapture, take place when we see that lining up on this side we're that much closer let me give you just a couple of things number one the mark of the beast many of you have emailed me or texted me or talked to me about the shot asking if the shot is the mark of the beast as i understand the mark of the beast um, that cannot be revealed until Antichrist is revealed. So you're going to be okay on that. On that part of it. But I'll tell you what every one of us are seeing. All of us are seeing how deceived people can be. We're all seeing how all this can line up. We're all seeing now how the central bank is beginning to fail and how the one world banking system could come swooping back in. We're seeing right now that the world is looking for somebody to help us out of this mess. In fact, the G20 is meeting right now. A lot I can say about that, but I'm going to try to stay off of the politics part of it. Let me just say that as, as you and I see these things begin to happen, we're getting closer to the rapture. Now, I rewind. This verse that I just read to you is found in Matthew 24. 
And this gospel of the kingdom, that's the gospel of the kingdom during that time, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I think particularly that's talking about the uh, second coming of Christ. We're looking for the rapture. But here's what I'm saying. Just like we see things lining up for the tribulation, this verse falls in that context. You understand, I want you to fully understand, that if the church would get fired up and give out the gospel, number one, it'll save the perishing. Number two, it could bring revival. But number three, it also could be the last thing that happens before Jesus Christ comes back. Why would we want not to, why would we want not, we not want to obligate ourselves to giving out the gospel? We're living in very crucial times when things need to be happening quickly. And one of those things should be the giving out of the gospel. I want us just to take a quick look at something. Take your Bibles, please, and I'll finish. This is my conclusion to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, we find the Great Commission. Jesus makes us a little phrase statement right here that I don't want you to miss. His last words, verse 18, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Let's read this last phrase together. Ready? Even unto the end of the world. Amen. Why do you say that? Because there's going to come a time when this world's going to come to an end. And there's going to come a time when the gospel will not be given out again. I believe that nothing can stop the wheels of prophecy. But I also believe that the gospel is our victor's cry what it's all about the gospel let's just take it personally how are you going to get out of this mess how are you going to get out of it if everything begins to close in on us how are you going to get out of it <laughs> tell you how I'm going to get out of a preacher I got me a gun and bullets and I've got a generator and I've got water and I've got all this stuff and I'm going to shoot squirrels and I'm going to do all that no, no, no. I'm asking you how you're going to get out of this thing. How are you going to get out of this world? How are you going to get to heaven? Because if you think you can hold out and you don't believe in the rapture and you're going to go through the tribulation period, I, trust me, they'll hunt you down, they'll find you. Don't worry about that. Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you how you're going to get out of it. Same way I'm going to get out of it. On May 30th, 1965, I bowed my head and prayed and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I know right now if something happened to me, that I'd be going to heaven. How many of y'all believe that? Say amen. amen. And everybody deserves to hear that.